Hi, everyone. I'm Ross Porter. We've got a guest today who needs no introduction, but I will list his accomplishments with you in just a few seconds. He was regarded as the top American network television newscaster for a number of years. He was one of the best. A friend of mine, because he and I worked together at KNBC in Los Angeles for about five years. And uh, it's wonderful to have him aboard today. The pride of Yankton, South <laughs> Dakota, Tom Brokaw. Tom, how are you? I'm very well, Ross. I'm glad you worked that in. We did have a great, great time together there at KNBC in Los Angeles. And later I'll talk about the most memorable night and you'll remember it, it involved Woody Hayes, as you may Oh recall. yeah, yeah, I remember that. Well, you <laughs> retired in January this year after uh, 55 years at NBC News. Didn't that make you the longest standing anchor in America at the same network? Yeah, it is. And I, you know, when I look back on it, I, I'm just astonished. I was so, so lucky in many ways. I, as you said, I grew up in a small town in South Dakota. And then I, I caught the wave uh, at the right time. I started in Sioux City and then I went quickly to Atlanta and then they picked me up and brought me to Los Angeles. And that's when you and I began to work together. And I was 26 at the time. Yeah. And after that, I went on to Washington to become the White House correspondent and from there to the Today Show and then to Nightly News. And it all seems now kind of like a fantasy because I was so lucky and it was what I had dreamed of, never thinking it could come true when I was spending time out there in South Dakota, marrying Meredith, who you know. Yes. My high school classmate and Miss South Dakota. And Miss South we, Dakota, yes, she was. You know, we just had a, we've had a wonderful, wonderful life. We're here in Montana now, where yeah. we spend a lot of time. You will be married 60 years next year. Lynn and I reach 60 in June. So that is kind of comparable, isn't it? <laughs> well, I just think it was a representative of our generation. You know, we, we married the first girl that we fell in love with, and we kept the marriage going. And uh, we were always, you know, always thought the most of the two of you, especially when you started turning out all those twins. <laughs> well, for those who don't know, Len and I had two sets of twins, boy, girl, each time. Uh, they're in their 50s now and doing very well. Tom, when you left Los Angeles, as you say, you became the White House correspondent for NBC, then co-anchor of the Today Show for uh, five years, anchor and managing editor of NBC's Nightly News for 22 years, and before that, four years as the program's weekend anchor. Folks, Tom Brokaw is the only person to have hosted all three major NBC News programs, the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, and Meet the Press. He's also been, gosh, I, I think at least 30 documentaries that he's been a part of and written, special correspondent, narrator. Uh, and you tell me you're in the middle of writing another book. What number will this be? Well, this book is about my parents. My, you know, I've written about World War II and I've written about uh, our business. But this book is about my parents who were true children of the 20th century. My dad was born in 1912, my mother in 1917, and they hit the wall because the, the economy was going to hell, frankly, at that point. They went through the very difficult times of the 20s and then the depression. And my dad had dropped out of school in the third grade. And a lot of people thought he would never amount to much, but he was a genius, it turns out at operating heavy construction equipment. So he could always mm -hmm. get a job. He could make mm -hmm. a caterpillar look like it was a dancer on, on ice. He was just <laughs> unbelievably <laughs> equipped with it. He was red haired. He, was, he had a great sense of humor. My mother came from a college educated family and she wanted to go to college, but when she graduated from high school in advance at 15, it was just not possible. So the two of them just decided that they would plow through life and save money every year, had three boys. We lived in an army base during World War II, then we lived in a big dam out in South Dakota, and then we moved eventually to Yankton, which is where I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I would have to say, oh, by the way, what's the title of the book going to be? Well, it's Red and Gene. My dad was red haired, very yeah. red haired. Red yeah. and Gene and the American Dream, because yeah. they really did live it. Was, it. was this your favorite book? Yeah, well, and that was. Was this uh, your favorite? And I, I'll bet you it's been your bestseller, hasn't it? Oh, it was a huge bestseller. It was one of the best selling books of the 20th century. How many copies? And it happened yeah. Because, you know, I lived on an army base and then we lived on a, a, a kind of a a very involved army situation after the war. And I went to Normandy to just to do reporting on what had happened there. You know, I remember Normandy, but yeah. you know, by the time I was in my twenties and thirties, it had kind of faded from me until I went to those beaches and walked them with those men who went ashore that day and saved the world. There's no other way of describing it because they were successful at great risk and I came home and I, it just it just worked on me. So I started collecting the stories. And I said to Meredith, I want to call it the greatest generation. And she said, Oh, Tom, I know that's going too far. And my, <laughs> my editor, my editor said the same thing. Oh, I'm not so sure, Tom. I said, that's what I'm calling it, damn it. <laughs> and <laughs> it's become part of the language. How many copies has it sold? You know, I've lost track, but it, it's in the millions. It was it was one of the best selling books of the 20th century. I had I had a wonderful Irish mother who wrote to me. She had a lot of children and a lot of cousins who were all in the war. Hmm. So she wrote to me after it had been out about six months and said, Mr. Brokaw, please stop. I've gotten 15 copies of this book. <laughs> <laughs> all my nieces and nephews That's and everybody gross. else. Tom, when did you decide to uh, become a broadcaster? You know, my friends all say it was very early. I was a talkative kid. I lived in, a, in an army base where we didn't have television. We had radio. Oh, but yeah. I was always interested in what was going on around town. And when I got to Pickstown, which is an army base as well, I had a lot of friends who come from around the country and were working there. And I was interested in their stories. How did they grow up? What was going on? What were you interested in? Mm -hmm. And then I knew what their dads, most of them had been in the war. So everybody says to this day, if we needed somebody to talk, it would be Brokaw. <laughs> <laughs> how, much radio, how much radio did you do? Pardon me? How much radio did you do? I did a lot of radio. When I moved to Yankton, I was just 15. I was a new kid in town. And I immediately yeah. got hired by the radio station. I had a rock and roll show in the, at nighttime. <laughs> they hired me full time during the summer months. Uh, and I would work like you did. I would do, you know, sports, whatever was required. I remember my first election night. I was 15 years old. And they'd hired me to go out to the country and get the results. And I thought, this is how I want to spend my life. This is yeah. so exciting. It's so important. Yeah. Well, you and I, again, very similar there. I started at 14. You started at 15. And uh, I look back on that time and I think, you know, how fortunate both of us were to grow up in a small town, in a small state that gave us the opportunity to see what we could do on the air. Can you imagine if we'd been in Los Angeles at 14 and 15, what the odds would have been that we'd be on the radio? <laughs> I know, I know. I thought about that a lot. And, you know, we have, Ross, we've not only been good friends in college, but we, we have had such similar backgrounds and the same values. You know, you've been married forever. I have been married forever. You know, we both still love what we do. You know, I still pick up the sports page first in the morning and take a look oh. at what's going on. And yeah. I remember... <laughs> I remember when you and I were standing there together when Woody Hayes got in big trouble, you know, yeah. because he slugged a, a photographer. Then it turns out he hit the wrong guy. Yeah, the, he tackled a player, didn't he? <laughs> well, and all the Ohio State uh, mucky mucks said to Hayes, you've got to go on Tom Brokaw and Ross because they're the most popular guys in town. So he came on and he had a chip on his shoulder. You remember that? He was no, not happy. I don't. Happy about I don't. You must have interviewed him. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> and then he was waiting for us. And it turns out he hit the guy that he didn't mean to hit. <laughs> he meant to hit <laughs> another guy. So those were the days. Yeah. 
your TV career began in Sioux City, Iowa. Um, not only as a newsman, Brokaw, but I just uh, read the other day that you also did the weather at some times. Is I that did. correct? <laughs> I often wanted to go back and apologize to all those people who listened to my weather forecast because I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you continued, um, well, in Omaha and Atlanta. You came to KNBC in Los Angeles in 1966. You got there, I think, about six months before I did. You said that uh, you were 26. I was 27. And remember, we lived about four blocks apart. And Meredith and Lynn used the same cleaning crew. <laughs> right. They did. I remember that. <laughs> Tom announced the 11 o'clock news every weeknight for six years. And I sat next to him, given the sports report. And uh, those last four years before he went east, the first person to give the sports report on the 11 o'clock newscast was our mutual friend, Rafer Johnson. Now, if you don't know, friends, Rafer won the Olympic gold medal in the decathlon at the games in Rome in 1960. If you don't know what the decathlon is, made up of 10 track and field events, four running, three jumping, three throwing. And the winner of the decathlon is usually considered the best athlete in the world. I have a trivia question for you. Who was Rafer Johnson's roommate at the Rome Games? Boy, that was, that's one of the few things I don't know about it. Uh, Cassius I remember Clay. Who? Oh, Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay. Clay. Became Muhammad Ali. Ali. Yeah. Um, he was in a great <laughs> In 2014, you were awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor any civilian citizen in this country can receive. What were you feeling that day, Tom? Well, I was feeling, I'm sorry that my parents aren't here. I had my whole family and uh, we have a wonderful, as you do, uh, a wonderful group of children. And one of my best moments was I was walking down the aisle to get it. And my eldest granddaughter reached over and gave me a high five as I walked by. <laughs> so, oh, wow. you know, uh, those were the days when you, you know, as you and I grew up in the same way, when you just think, God, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. The White House. Wow. The president wow. putting something around my neck. Wow. Right. Well, I've, I've asked Tom friends to join me and others in seeking to, Make sure that Rafer Johnson, who passed away only last December, is presented the Presidential Medal of Freedom posthumously. I didn't realize that he had not been a recipient of that medal, did you? No, I did not. And it was one of the worst oversights I can imagine. And I'm going to work with you and make sure that he gets the attention that he deserves. They've never done anything posthumously. But Raper would be the perfect person yes, to give would. that medal of freedom posthumously. He was the true American hero, wasn't he? He was. And the other thing about him that a lot of people don't, I think, have an appreciation. He was so humble. And he was oh, also yeah. so oh. accommodating. You know, we, we really became close friends. So I when, we were in a, when we were in Australia for the Olympics, I went to all the events with him and his daughter, who was competing at the time. I yeah. wanted to be with him. Right. And we just had the best time. So he said to me, Tom, you're going to be the parade marshal for the Rose Bowl for it. And I said, I am. He said, I'm going to come to the end. I'm going to find my way to the end so I can give you a big hug. And he did. You oh. know, that's a long way to walk. And yeah. And then we stayed in touch after that. He's just, I don't think I've ever known a better person than Rafer. You know, one of my uh, favorite stories, and it's not a very happy story, was, of course, as everybody knows, he tackled Sirhan Sirhan along with, uh, I think, Rosie Greer and George Plimpton that night. Right. And uh, he told us that later he'd been in derogated for three, four, five hours. He went home, and as he was taking his, his clothes off, he reached in his jacket, and there was the gun that he had taken away. I mean, I, and he called the police and I, I've got something I think he wants. <laughs> yeah, I know. We actually talked about that a lot. And I did a, a story with him about it. Uh, that was part of the crazy time. And it was so heartbreaking. 
that raper, you know, who loved Bobby Kennedy oh, like a brother. Yeah. You know, and yeah. he had to be there at the worst moment. Yeah. And he never came back to television. And that's when I moved in with you at 11 o'clock. But you know, too, Tom, that, that Rafer really, I think, summarized his life. He emphasized it with the motto of be the best you can be. He stuck to yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's what he was. We, uh, we became really close personal friends, Meredith included. And I remember coming into our house one time. We were living over in the valley. And we were doing a cookout. And I, I couldn't find Raper, and I couldn't find our eldest daughter, who was about three. And in the backyard, Raper was carrying her around and pointing out the stars. And she wow. was just, wow, she was bedazzled by that. And that's who he was. Yeah. Well, he and I and our families went to the same church. My oldest daughter taught second grade Sunday school, and Rafer was her assistant. He sat in with her every Sunday because he wanted to be with the young men. That just tells you something about Rafer Johnson. That's so I hope we can pull this off, and uh, I think we can. All right, folks, now let's focus on Tom Brokaw's love of baseball. I'll tell you, uh, before I get to that, though, I want to thank you very much. Uh, among the books you wrote was one called Boom, and here it is. <laughs> Yeah. And inside it says to Lynn and Ross, old friends are real friends. Tom, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, I felt that way. You know, you and I were two guys from the middle of America. We wanted to do what we ended up doing and yeah. uh, it could not have worked out better. Sometimes I would say, Ross, you've taken too much time on the sports. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But I really, well, I really just cherish our relationship, and I so admired you and what you do. You could, I used to say, you put Ross Porter in front of a camera and just say, tell us something about sports. And 25 minutes later, he will give you a whole <laughs> encyclopedia of sports. Yeah, you're too kind. Many years ago, a book that was titled What Baseball Means to Me was published. You wrote one of the essays. I found it the other day, and I want to share some of what you wrote. I was a part of a collection of 11 and 12-year-old boys who were athletic and competitive. We played baseball every day during the summer on the town field in South Dakota, a dirt infield diamond with an uneven outfield. We had no umpires or adult supervision. But we managed to get along surprisingly well, arriving at balls and strikes and outs by consensus. We often turned to the only non-player in our crowd. He was fair, and we accepted his rulings. I played second base like my hero Jackie Robinson and swung his signature bottle-handed bat. In those hot summers, the games were almost always in the mornings so that we could reserve the afternoons for swimming in the nearby river or at a pool seven miles away. Did you go on bicycles seven miles? I don't know. But you said, we'll wind up the day at the drugstore, teasing the high school girls who served us fountain cokes and double dip ice cream cones for a dime. Funny days, huh? Those were the days, uh, you know, in that. Uh... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm got a frog in my throat, but that young man who called the ball strikes for us died yeah. of leukemia yeah. the following summer. And one of the most moving events of my life was these nine, 10, and 11 year old boys, the, the pheasants and the, uh, I can't remember what the other team was right now. Oh, uh, uh, anyhow, we all gathered on the baselines and paid tribute to Johnny Strutz who had died that winter. And it was as moving a ceremony as you could have had yeah. at the Hall of Fame. Wow. Um, in this book, I learned something I didn't know because you never told me. But I think there's a reason for that. You were a Dodgers fan, but we didn't talk about it because we were in LA and you had been gone from KNBC for I think four years before I ever went to the Dodgers. But a couple of things in there that I thought were very interesting. In your words, 
I was a 17 year old visiting New York. I managed to find my way to Ebbets Field, home of my beloved Dodgers. Why were you in New York at 17? Because I was the governor of something called Boy State. Boy State, they had wow. Well, Big honor. I had been the governor that year. And then they, Joe Foss was a big war hero, and he was the governor of South Dakota. And yeah. the, uh, the American Legion said, we're going to put the two of you together, and you've been invited on a quiz show called Two for the Money. And so I went to New York. Joe and I did well. We made $650 a piece. And then I was determined to go to uh, see the Dodgers play, Evans Field. Last summer, they were there. Jackie had retired the year before. Mm -hmm. And I went down to a ticket place and I said, I want to go see the Dodgers play. I want to buy a couple of tickets. And I was very tan and very fit. And they thought I was an Indian. <laughs> and, I, and they said, oh, great. And then they, they drew out the lines for me how I could get out to Ebbets Field. You know, I was 17 from South Dakota and I got on the subways and rode two different ones out there, sat in Ebbets Field. And everybody around me was a Dodger fan. And then they said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from South Dakota. And you're a Dodger fan? And I said, yeah. They said, okay, listen to us. We know everything that's going on here. And they would point out Duke Snyder's wife. He would turn and tip his hat to her before he went to the plate. Woody, I mean, uh, they were playing the Giants. So it was one heck of a game, as you might imagine. Was Mays, so was there Mays said, playing? Willie Mays in the lineup? Yeah. And, and, and there I was watching all of this. And I, I, I later have talked to people who were there as well. And then one of my favorite stories about the Dodgers is that the last year that, that uh, I was really able to get on and see the games was at the same time, the greatest pitcher I believe in baseball was wrapping up his season, Sandy. Yeah. And about five years ago, I was doing something at the Hall of Fame and he sent word, I didn't know him that well, he sent word he wanted to have dinner with me. Wow. And so he put together this enormous collection of great, great people. And he turned to me and he said, I watched you every night, Tom. You could not tie a good tie. And I said, oh, my <laughs> God, you remember that? I was a terrible knot. And he said, it sure uh, was. And we <laughs> high-fived each other. So, you know, those are the great things that you and I have been able to, to have access to. Well, another thing about that, Tom, was after he retired from uh, the Dodgers, we started doing uh, high school basketball on Channel 4 on Saturday afternoons. They were looking for an analyst to go with me to do play-by-play, -play, and we finally figured out we could get Sandy because he was still under contract with NBC. And right. he and I did high school basketball, and one day, Beverly Hills played aviation. The game went five overtimes, if you can I believe, believe it. That. And of course, I've never, never heard that. Story yeah. Before. And with him, the problem was getting from the uh, scorer's table to your car after the game because everybody was trying to get his autograph. <laughs> right. 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 He's still, uh, I think, one of the great American heroes. Yes, He's he is. So modern. He looks yeah. great. Yeah. You know, he, we have mutual friends, and he just could not be more pleasant with everybody. Well, you know, when you say that, I think what we're saying in effect is that Rayford Johnson and Sandy Koufax were both alike because of their yeah. humbleness. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, two icons, and yet they, they were as nice as you could be. Well, more from that book. You said, I was sitting with my family behind the Yankee dugout the night Reggie Jackson hit three home runs in a row off first pitches in the deciding game of the 1977 World Series against the Dodgers. My kids discarded the Dodger heritage on that spot and became Yankee fans. Yeah, right. They sure did. <laughs> I remember that very well. When the first time that Reggie came up, my eldest daughter, who had bet 25 cents with a classmate, about she was betting, you know, on, uh, on behalf of the Dodgers because of me. And then he hit one out. And I said, well, it doesn't happen every day time jennifer he comes up again and she said well daddy is you know it's reggie and i said yeah but you know that was lucky he hits the second one out he gets up there for the third time she looks at me and says well <laughs> i said i'm not going there oh yeah and he hits the third one out yeah 
home runs off Bert Hooten, Elias Sosa, and Charlie Huff. And Tom, that might have been the biggest audience I've ever had in my career because I did that World Series for CBS Radio, and there were over 600 stations around the world that carried uh, my account of the game. So that was kind of a thrill for me. One more from you. I was in Dodger Stadium the night Kirk Gibson hit the most electrifying home run I will ever see. Yeah, I was there as well, by the way. Uh, That's what I, I was, say. Yeah, you said I was in Dodger Stadium. I'm quoting you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened. I went out because I wanted to be at the game and NBC was carrying it. And, uh, and so everybody came over to say hello. And, uh, and, and when, when he came up, you know, at the end, somebody turned to me and said, you know, he hits this pitcher. And I said, yeah, but, and it was one of the most electrifying moments you could possibly imagine. I'll never forget it. Pumping. <laughs> he ran those baselines. Oh, yeah. Well, here's a little sidelight to that. I was sitting in the Dodger clubhouse with Kirk Gibson in the bottom of the ninth inning. And we were watching the NBC telecast on a monitor above us. Tom, you know how little things can change history. And I witnessed such a moment. Vin Scully said to Joe Gargiola on television, Joe, I can tell you there's one man we won't see tonight. That's Kirk Gibson. He can barely walk. Well, when Gibson heard that, he screamed at the clubhouse attendant, go tell the sorta I can hit. Mitch Poole came back in a couple of minutes. He said, Tommy says, get dressed, but stay hidden. He doesn't want Tony La Russa to know who you can hit. So Gibson got dressed. I followed him down the ramp to the field. And I looked over the right field bullpen. All you could see were cars with red brake lights flashing people trying to oh, beat the crowd out of the stadium. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and there is no doubt in my mind to this day that if Vin had not made that comment to Joe, Gibson would never have batted and the outcome of that game would have been different. It was really one of the most electrifying moments that either of us will ever see in any sport that you can imagine. Yeah, it was voted the number one sports moment in Los Angeles sports history. Tom, I want to get a little more serious now. In August of 2013, you were diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a treatable but incurable cancer. What were your first thoughts when the doctor told you? Well, my first thought was I'd had a hard summer. I mean, a very active outdoors, as you know, and I had been, I'd been shooting in Africa, I had been fishing in Montana, but I had this persistent backache. And I, go, I went to see a, a, an orthopedist, orthopedist that I had used for a long time. He said, I, Tom, I think it's your lifestyle. I was on the board of the Mayo Clinic and it was still there, so I went out and the orthopedist there said the same thing. My primary physician in Rochester said, something's going on, I'm gonna take a look. And he spent an entire morning doing what they call evidentiary medicine, reducing and reducing what do we have? And then he came to the conclusion that I had this cancer. And they called me in without telling me what they were about to uh, unload on me. And I sat there thinking, well, what are they talking about? And at the end, the primary uh, cancer physician at, at the Mayo Clinic turned to me and he said, you've got a cancer. And it's a fatal cancer. But I think we're here early enough that we can get on top of it. But you know people who have died from this. And I just want to make you clear that this is going to change your life, Tom. Mm. I was, uh, I almost passed out at that point. I remember walking back to my room at the Mayo Clinic and thinking, what the hell is going on with me? And I was doing a documentary on uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. It was the 50th year. So I would be working in my office, in my hotel room, typing that. And then I would turn over and type multiple myeloma, what is this? And I got lucky. I was in otherwise good health. I had fantastic care. I had a doctor from uh, Boston, I had a doctor from uh, the Mayo Clinic, and I had a doctor from NBC, I mean, from, uh, from New York. They were three of the best specialists in the world. And they said, we're gonna beat this. Mm -hmm. And they did. 
Yeah. I, you know, I still have issues. I have, as I sit here, I've got a lot of damage in my back. And so I have to be careful about walking, you know, overdoing it. But the cancer is in a rest, thank God. Beautiful, beautiful. And you continued to work for NBC throughout all those treatments. And 16 months later, you announced that your cancer was in full remission. And in fact, you wrote a book telling about your battle, didn't you? Yeah, I, you know, I, what I tell you, Ross, I didn't want to make me the cancer victim of the year. I, I wanted to keep this as private as possible. I'll tell you one wonderful story about it. For the first five months, we didn't let it out. I, I was telling people at the office, I have to work at home because I've got an issue that I'm dealing with and it's better if I do this at home. I didn't say anything about cancer. And then finally, it did get out that I had this cancer. And at that point, it was still a fatal cancer. So uh, it, when it got out, it got out as it does with everything these days. It was everywhere. Tom Brokaw has got cancer. And then people started calling me and said, I had no idea that you were going through this. And I said, no, because I really wanted to make it private for me because there are other people who are in worse shape than I am. It was the most instructive experience of my life, quite honestly. I met great physicians. I met people who were empathetic. And I met a lot of cancer patients who wrote to me and said, we're going through the same thing. So in some odd way, it was life assuring me that you're going to have to deal with this. You know, you've had a fantastic life, but now we've got to get on with dealing with this possibly fatal disease, and we have beaten it. Wow, beautiful. I want to tell a personal story. A friend of mine called me uh, oh, probably two years ago, and he said, I have cancer. Tom Brokaw's had cancer. I know you're friends with him. Do you think there's any chance he would talk to me about my condition? Well, I contacted you and you called my friend. He was so grateful that you would take your time to call him. And he told me what you said to him. And I'll try to paraphrase it. You told him, this is your life. And we're talking about you being able to get through this. You have to control it and get a second opinion if you feel like you'd want one. Tom, I'm happy to tell you my friend is still alive today after nearly 40 treatments. Thank you. Oh, I listen, it is a club that you don't want to join. But when you get into it, I think it's most important that you all kind of help each other. Well, you did a wonderful job for him. One more personal note. When I was inducted into the Southern California Sports Broadcasters Hall of Fame, Tom bought a full page ad in the program, handed out that day, congratulating me on the honor. I hope I thanked you by mail, but this is the first time I've had an opportunity to do it face to face. Well, I, Ross, I've always thought we came out of the same gene pool. You know, we were Midwestern guys. We married fabulous women. We were devoted to what we did. Uh, we had differences from time to time, but I really, I have the greatest affection and esteem for who you are and how you live your life and your family as well. So we were a couple of very lucky Midwestern kids. Very nice of you to say that. And I can't recall any differences that you and I ever had, but it just shows a sign of class by Tom Brokaw. Let me ask you, were you surprised I left KNBC to go to the Dodgers? I was, but I also thought it was a great move because I thought now the country gets to see more of it. And I thought, you know, it was important for you to get out of just being on KNBC and kind of spreading your wings, so to speak. So I was proud of you. Thank you. Well, I love play-by-play. -play. That was the key thing. And I got my, got my wish. 28 years of wonderful coverage of uh, one yeah, of the great no, teams true. ever. Yeah. Uh, my producer, Mike Cuter, insists that I ask you if you have any stories about me that you would like to tell today. Well, the story that I like best of all was the Woody Hayes story. Uh -huh. <laughs> People may not remember that, but he was accused of slugging a photographer on the sidelines and <laughs> all hell broke loose after the Rose Bowl. 
Yeah. And he insisted that he, the guy was, had it coming. So the Ohio State people asked the Rose Bowl people, what do we do? And they said, put him on with Brokaw and Ross Porter and let him try to explain himself. <laughs> you remember, he didn't want to talk to either one of us. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's right. And finally, finally, I have to tell the end of the story. He watched, stormed off. And you and I were saying, well, we won't see him again. And we walked out and there he was just outside the door well. Yeah. And I thought, my God, is he going to take a swing at us? Yeah. And then he said, I want to see that film again. And I said, okay. So we took him upstairs and showed him the film. He looked at me, he <laughs> said, I hit the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, new, that's not who I meant to hit. <laughs> We both just exploded in laughter. It was one of the very memorable moments. I thought that we'd like to hear some of your views and experiences on several subjects. In 1989, you were the first English language broadcast journalist to report the fall of the Berlin Wall. You stood on the west side of the Brandenburg Gate. How were you able to do that? Did you get a tip? Well, it's a great story, and it's a great story in part because I can share it with some of my colleagues. We had a very good foreign editor at NBC in those days, and he came to me on Monday and said, you know, not much going on here. Well, why don't you go to Germany? This seems to be kind of boiling. And I said, that's a great idea. So I went over. I flew all night. We didn't tell anybody. Else. And the next day when I was there, it was very quiet in Berlin on both sides. And then on the second day, we were all in the kind of worn out. It was a huge press corps. And a, and a East German, uh, <laughs> only describe him as a flack, he got this piece of paper and he said, oh, we can now allow East Germans to go through the gate and if they come back. He read it all wrong. They, were, they didn't want him to go out. They wanted him to stay where they were. So everybody looked at each other and said, are we hearing things? What's going on here? I had the only interview with him. I went upstairs, Gunter Schabowski was his name. And I said, Mr. Schabowski, read that again. And he read it and said, da, it means that you can go out through the gate and then return through the same gate. Well, he was misinterpreting everything. I called New York and I said, kill everything. The Berlin Wall is coming down. It's a huge, huge story. And by midnight that night, there was this huge crowd from the, uh, from the West German side, chanting at the people on the other side, come over, come over. And they, they were scared because they thought they'd get shot. And finally, right before I said, good evening, the first kid landed up on the top of the wall. He was an East German and he looked around and he thought, oh my God. And I came on and said, good evening on one of the most uh, uh, astonishing days in the history of the 20th century. The Berlin Wall is coming down. It was one of the great, great hits of my career, and I had a lot of help. Oh, uh, my. You know, the guy who suggested that I go, for example, mm. uh, and the people who were there, it was a brilliant job. You conducted the first one on one American television interviews with Soviet heads Gorbachev and Putin. How'd you pull that off? Well, we, uh, <coughs> man, he was great, great uh, executive at NBC. He was an old timer. He always was working the angles. And he took it upon himself to try to get Gorbachev to talk. And he knew a lot of the Russians. And he came to me one day and he said, we got the interview. It was a huge scoop. And so I flew over there. Gorbachev didn't quite play by the rules. He spent the first 10 minutes praising the Soviet Union. He was only supposed to take questions from me. But when he finally shut up, I, I leaned in and I said to him, Mr. Gorbachev, what happens now? Where do we go from here? And we actually became friends out of, as a result of that interview. When he would come to New York, he'd come to my house for dinner. Wow. When I was in Russia, I'd go see him. Hmm. Uh, but he, you know, they tried, he kind of overstated his position. And they were, they, the, the old right wingers tried to remove him, uh, but he hung in there. And I still am in touch with him. He was a, one of the great men of the 20th century. Wow. Tom, let me ask you a couple of current questions because you're a keen observer of things going on and also candid and very honest. Why is there virtually no bipartisanship in Congress? I, uh, Ross, I've thought about that a lot. 
And the part of the problem is everybody has a microphone now. You know, it used to be that you'd look across America and there were these outlets, Republican, Democrat, and in between. And they had kind of a standing, a station. Now, you can be living in the most remote part of southwestern Montana and you can get online because there are the instruments that allow you to do that. And you can pump out stuff that is not true. And I'm not talking about true left or right. I'm talking about it's just not true. And overnight, you'll have a couple million people who believe what you're saying. And so that is spread across the country. And it's kind of a contagion. And this is on the left and on the right and in the middle. And it's, I think, the greatest challenge for a democracy. I really do. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, back in the old days, Ronald Reagan would have dinner with Tip O'Neill. Well, you know, Reagan was, a, a, I actually, when I arrived in Washington, he'd been governor for two terms in California, finishing the second term. And all the New York heavyweights, press people said, ah, you know, he's just a, an actor. I said, you watch. I had gone through two terms with him in California. Yeah. He was so savvy. And he was also, I thought, the most important thing. He was able to connect to the American people. He wasn't playing to the to the uh, to the newsrooms. He was playing to the American people, and he had that great American story about how he grew up and the whole thing. He was a you know he was kind of a curious guy. He could be uh, kind of awkward in a lot of ways. He would not like to step out of his standing, and then when he would decide to light it up, no one could light it up better than he did. Yeah. Let me tell, tell you one more funny story about it. Yeah. And his last Friday in office, I had the final interview with him, and I'd been there from the beginning. And it was all carefully arranged. And then at the end, he turned to me and he said, Tom, let's have our picture taken out on the Rose Garden. And everybody was, oh, we didn't arrange for that. He said, come with me. So we go out there. And he puts his arm around me. And he said, Nancy and I were talking this morning about you were there at the very beginning of my career. And I said, I sure was, Mr. President. He put his arm around me. The cameraman came over and he said, it worked out pretty well for both of us, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, you have the same birthday as Ronald Reagan, February the 6th. <laughs> Did you ever exchange birthday gifts? Well, no, but I'll tell you what happened is that we were at the, at the White House one day on our birthday. And I had not said anything about it. And uh, the president came in to the room and Dan rather, who has been a friend of mine for a long time, stood up and he said, Mr. President, I'd like to lead my, uh, my colleagues here in singing happy birthday to you. And so everybody sang happy birthday and he finished and Reagan as only Reagan could said, well, thanks Dan. Tom and I really appreciated that because it's his birthday too. <laughs> I thought Dan was gonna pass out at that point. <laughs> Next, have you seen our country as divided as it is now? No, I wasn't around in the 30s when it was pretty divided then, but now the instruments of division are there for anybody. You know, they can just reach over and, and hit a key and they can be on the air around the, around the country. And, uh, and mostly I find that the people who are in the political game these days they're more interested in division than they are in unity. That's what really troubles me. Yeah. Is there a solution? It takes courage on the part of people from both parties. You know, they've got to get together and find a way to do this. We cannot continue with this kind of mud fight 24 seven. And that's really what it is. The Republicans this past week were giving the president and he had, what he had done was something that they had recommended <laughs> two years ago. On the other hand, the Democrats are guilty of that kind of thing as well. Everybody just wants to play gotcha. And we've got to get beyond that. Yeah. Well, you know, like I know that uh, it's a very, very uh, difficult world right now. And, and hopefully we're going to be able to, uh, to pull through it. Tom, did you ever have any, uh, I would call, uh, favorite TV newscasters you kind of looked up to or you liked their style or you later worked with them and really thought they were wonderful people well i i had a lot of those kinds of friends frankly uh on both sides of the aisle by the way uh 
but uh, David Brinkley was one of my first heroes uh, yeah. because he, he he introduced a new style and it was so succinct and smart and everything. At the end of his life was quite tragic. He, he was not well and uh, he didn't marry well. And uh, so it was not a very happy time for him, unfortunately. But he was he was so brilliant and he could say in a matter of a few words, the exact summary of what we were all longing to hear. So he was a great, great friend of mine at the time. Morley Safer at CBS was a, a, like a brother. We were great pals, even though we were on opposite sides of the aisle. And there was nobody like Andy Rooney. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was just hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I, I just liked being around. Those are CBS people. At NBC, obviously, I was a beneficiary of working with John Chancellor yeah. and the people that were at the had one game ahead of me. And they yeah. treated me extremely well. I was a kid from the West Coast. Who is this guy? What are they doing here? And they would always kind of back me up. So I was always grateful for that. But a lot of my friends, quite honestly, Ross, were in the newspaper business. I'm a writer as well as a broadcaster. Yeah. And when, I, when they discovered that I could write, they looked at me in a different way. Yeah. Tom, I have always thought uh, your first love in television news was politics. And you did such a good job covering it. Well, it was my first love. And it was, I'll tell you, Ross, it was in part because of how I grew up. My mother was a real political junkie. She worked <laughs> in the post office in the small town. She knew everything that was going on. She wanted to be a, uh, she wanted to be a journalist. It didn't work out for her. But she would come home at night and we would talk politics when I was in the seventh grade. Wow. She you know, would say something that had happened that day, you know, in the post office. I'll just tell you one quick story. One day, we lived in a, uh, quasi army base in the middle of South Dakota <clears throat> in the 1950s. And she said, Gordon Larson, who was a really popular guy in our town, he fixed your furnace and he always had a pocket full of candy and everything. He had come in that day to the post office and he was kind of complaining mildly about the behavior of the high school kids the night before, which was Halloween. And my mother looked at him and said, Oh, come on, Gordon, what were you doing when you were 17? And he looked at her and he said, I was landing on Guadalcanal. And he turned around and walked out. And I thought, she came home and she would tell me these stories at the end of the day. And I thought later when I was writing the book, I called her and I said, where is Gordon Morrison? Mother said, I know why you're calling because he's the guy that you want to talk to. I found him out in, in Montana where he was working on the Corps of Engineers. We were all part of the dam business. And I said, I left my number. He called me back and he said, Tommy, why are you calling me? I hadn't seen him in 25 years. And I said, Gordon, I'm writing a book about World War II. And my mother and I remember that you had a tough war. He long paused and he said, I never talk about it. And I said, no, I understand, but I'm doing a big story about it. Then there was another long pause. And I said, Gordon, are you still there? And he said, yeah, but I just realized I'm paying for this phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and that's who they were. And then yeah. he gave me a great, great interview. Yeah. In 2014, a new broadcast facility opened over on the Universal Studios Hollywood lot and was named in Tom's honor as the Brokaw News Center. Uh, that facility uh, houses our old station, KNBC, uh, also the Los Angeles Bureau of NBC News and the Telemundo station. Uh, Lynn and I were honored to be among a few of the guests that you invited to that ceremony. That was a very special day. It was, but I wanted the team to be there, and you were a hugely important part of all that. Uh -huh. And I always thought that we were in the business of helping each other. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I counted the number of awards that you've received. Uh, I may have missed a few. Uh, I looked at uh, the awards, I looked at the speeches. Uh, my report is that you've had 37 awards, 15 speeches, 13 of them at commencements. Do you use the same commencement speech? No, I don't. I, uh, I always try to be very current. So, uh, and then I always open with, you know, I, I had a, uh, I was a high school whiz kid. Uh, I was a 
you know, I was an outstanding athlete and I was an outstanding scholar. And then I went off the rails. You know, I dropped out of two colleges and then I caught, Meredith kind of brought me around and I, I caught up to it again. And so when I do any of those speeches, I always include that, you know, that uh, you're not looking at somebody who's always done things right. And if there's a lesson in humility, it is in failing. And I failed for a couple of years, but I got out of it. You sure did. You got a Phi Beta Kappa out of it. So I think. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I do. I do have a Phi Beta Kappa key. And I also have it. Uh, the President's Medal of Freedom, and I also have the, the, the greatest French offer that they have. Uh, and so it was to stand there in Paris and, and get the French acknowledgement was quite, quite uh, moving for me. And my family came as well, and friends were there. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's been a fantastic life. Uh, and I, I like to think that I still have a filter that is called humility, that I, that I have, I've failed enough in my life that I know how it can happen again, so I don't want that to happen again. We talked about it briefly. You married Miss South Dakota. How'd you meet Meredith? Well, I'm, <laughs> it's a good story. I, uh, I didn't move to the, uh, Yankton until I was a sophomore in high school. I had been working at a summer camp that year. My dad worked for the Corps of Engineers, so we moved around a lot. And then when I was a sophomore in high school, I was moving to Yankton and I only knew one person beside a roommate that I had at summer camp. And the roommate had the picture of this girl on his desk, Meredith, and he had a big case on her. But she wrote him a Dear John at the end of the summer saying, you know, this is not gonna work out. And I, that's all I knew about her. So the first day I was in school, some kid came running out of the high school and said, old Meredith is a cheerleader. That's the last thing that they expected. She was a scholar, she was a debater, and she was not part of the cheerleading crowd, but she was a cheerleader. She'd gotten elected when she was a sophomore. And then we became fast, fast friends. I was president of the class, she was vice president. We had the leads of the play. She was a cheerleader, I was a jock. And she would always tease me about having too many girlfriends, you know, all that <laughs> kind of stuff. And then in college, when I kind of ran off the rails, she gave me holy hell. She wrote me a letter saying, I don't know what's going on with you. Your parents are very upset and I don't want to hear from you again until you straighten out. <laughs> and, uh, God, you know, she's got my number. So <laughs> I really, I kind of put the uh, pedal to the metal. I got my grades up and I was going to school and working full time. And one day in the library, she came over and sat down next to me and said, I went too far. And I said, no, I had it coming, Meredith. I really did. And she said, well, I'm impressed with how you made the recovery. So we went and had a cup of coffee and never looked back. Wow, beautiful. They had three lovely daughters and they have done very, very well, even when they've gone into uh, professions, right? Yeah, I couldn't, uh, no, they were not inclined to do that. Our eldest daughter, they're all here with us, by the way, in Montana right now. Our eldest daughter is a physician and she's the chief medical officer of the San Francisco Fire Department. She has 2,500 oh. firemen under her, oh. under her thumb, and then she's you know dealing with them. The middle daughter is in the in the entertainment business. She's a she had a wonderful career, and she's now in, in investing in, in a lot of entertainment stuff. And the third daughter, Sarah, is a a, a therapist in Los Angeles. She has a huge practice of people her age and what she tries to help them through these difficult times. So she's very, very busy. Uh, and they are all different. They're all independent and they all give me a lot of grief when they want to. <laughs> one final question. Do you consider as one of your top achievements receiving an honorary degree at the University of Oklahoma, my alma mater? <laughs> I do, but I'm gonna tell you a good Oklahoma story. I, I did get an honorary degree. And then I went back for a game. I have a fabulous son-in-law who was a doctor as well, married to our doctor. And he was a big OU graduate. So oh, we went back for a game. We went back for a game. And I know the Oklahoma fans. And even though I'd been there during, you know, their most difficult days when, nine, when, when, the, when the explosion happened and I had been very supportive of them. And I went down and, and the, I don't think he was the president when you were uh, there, 
Uh, no, George Cross was the president when I was there. Yeah. George L. Cross. Yeah. And he made a statement one time. He said, we're trying to do what we can to make the, uh, the football players like us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that anyhow, they took me down on the field. I said, I don't want to be seen on camera because I know Oklahoma how it feels about a lot of reporters. And they introduced me and I didn't want them to do it. And the booze, <laughs> they just booed the hell out of me. <laughs> and they were, the administrators were so embarrassed. And I said, it's Oklahoma folks. <laughs> Tom, you're 81 years old. I'm 82. I think we've uh, proved today that we still have uh, our, our mental um, strengths with us. And, uh, Gosh, I've enjoyed this, and I hope you have. And and uh, my friend, I hope that we can uh, stay well together and uh, maybe cross paths again in a few years. We are connected. There's no question about it. We came up through the same way, from the same kind of backgrounds. You know, we have these fabulous families, and it's been a thrill to be with you. Thank you, Tom. The pride of Yankton, South Dakota, Tom Brokaw. <laughs>